But we begin tonight with breaking news in the special counsel's investigation into Donald Trump's efforts to try to remain in power after his 2020 election loss. Late this afternoon, The New York Times reported that federal prosecutors have questioned multiple witnesses in recent weeks, including Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, on whether Trump had privately acknowledged in the days after the 2020 election that he had lost. Jared Kushner was not the only one of Trump's closest advisors. But as MSNBC legal analyst Lisa Rubin reminded me, other than Trump advisor Jason Miller, no one was more involved in the post-election fundraising efforts pushing the big lie than Jared. That could also mean the campaign finance angle of the investigation is also very much alive. It's the latest sign of a potential third indictment for the twice impeached, twice indicted former president and the second coming from special counsel Jack Smith. While Smith has already brought charges against Trump for his mishandling of classified documents, as we see, he has also been hard at work on this other investigation. And from what we've been able to learn, it goes well beyond just the events of January 6th, including everything in the months leading up to the attack on the U.S. Capitol. In particular, we're also learning more about the special counsel's investigation into how Trump and his allies tried to pressure state officials to help overturn their state's election results, as well as forming the so-called alternate slates of electors in states Joe Biden won. Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson is now confirming that she spoke with federal prosecutors as part of that probe back in March. She joins the Secretary of State's from some of other 2020, some of the other 2020 battleground states, Arizona, Georgia, and Nevada, who have either been subpoenaed or have already spoken with the special counsel's team. And there are signs that the grand jury investigating Trump's efforts are back at it in the D.C. federal courthouse. One of the special counsel's lead investigators in that case, Thomas Windham, was spotted entering the building this morning. He was also seen there on Tuesday. Now, as far as we can tell, no notable witnesses were spotted in the courthouse on either day, making us wonder why else would he be there with the grand jury if no witnesses were present? If Jack Smith were to go forward with an indictment, it begs the questions. What would it look like? Well, a group of seven former prosecutors and defense attorneys with decades of constitutional and criminal law experience laid out just that in what's called a prosecution memorandum, something federal prosecutors would prepare before bringing an indictment. It would include admissible evidence, possible charges, and legal issues. And joining me now is attorney Joshua Stanton, one of the co-authors of that model prosecution menu. And Paul Butler, former federal prosecutor, Georgetown law professor, and MSNBC legal analyst. Uh, thank you both for being here. And, and I do want to start with you, Joshua. If you could just sort of Walk us through, I read the introduction to the memorandum that you all created, but walk us through sort of in simple terms what this prosecution memorandum alleges and what you think can be proven by Jack Smith if he were to prosecute a case like this. Well, we took the evidence that we found in the public record, much of which was pulled together by the January 6th committee and very helpfully uh, released in a report along with a whole host of supporting documents, which we looked through. Um, since then, there's also been a, quite a bit of public reporting. And so we analyzed all of that and essentially realized that probably the, the best case that special counsel Jack Smith could bring would be a kind of three act case focusing on strategies that Trump and his lawyers and lawyers for his campaign put together uh, in order to try to overturn the election through both legal and illegal means in the court and uh, in the White House itself. And when that failed, pushing uh, uh, Vice President Mike Pence to himself uh, overturn the election uh, in favor of Trump. And when that appeared to be failing, moving on to a third act and on January 6th itself, using his massive supporters, um, either bringing them there in order to actually engage in this insurrection, or a minimum, once they had moved into the White House, uh, knowingly failing to stop this, this assault uh, on, on the Capitol. Uh, and so in each one of those stages, there are a whole host of federal crimes that, that Trump and others could be charged with.
Right. And I mean, it is really, you lay it out, uh, you all lay it out so well. And I want to big up Barbara McQuaid, who apparently uh, inspired some of the work that uh, you all did uh, and who works also with Just Security as one of the uh, members of you all's team. But um, the three acts, right? So Trump knows he lost, but he doesn't want to give up power. So he sets up all these different schemes. The DOJ will make them do an investigation. We'll do these fake electors. We'll try that. And I just want to show the fake electors from one of the states. Um, let's just take a look at that, because this is what it kind of looked like. Um, and there were, I think we're going to put it up right. And I think this might have been Michigan. So you had these people actually meet um, Joshua Arizona. Sorry, this is Arizona, by the way, a state that's also investigating, maybe similar to the way Georgia is doing, whether any laws were broken there. These fake elector meetings, how do they play into what you see as a potential prosecution? Right. Well, what we understand is that there were a group of people, both in the Trump campaign as well as in the White House, uh, chief among them, Trump, his, uh, his lawyers, John Eastman, and Kenneth Chesbro, uh, who essentially orchestrated, uh, as, as the evidence supports, uh, a plan to have a, a, a kind of alternate slate of electors meet. And that alternate slate, as, as they described it in their memos, the concept was that they would submit certificates to Congress saying, we are the actual electors that were elected by our state uh, in favor of Trump. Now, those certificates that they signed on to, that these, that these alternate electors signed on to, of course, were fabricated. They were false. Biden won those states. Now, the, the people actually signing on to those may themselves not have fully understood the, the process, what they would be used for, why they were being used in that particular way. But the evidence does seem to show that at least the orchestrators of the scheme knew that they were false, knew that they would be submitted to Congress and be used in a way, uh, in an effort to overturn a lawful election. And that right. violates, again, a whole host, potentially, of, of federal statutes. And, and Paul Butler, I, I wonder, as a prosecutor, when you look at this and you look through this memo, and it read pretty uh, coherent, co you know, sort of cogently to me, um, does it matter if Donald Trump really believed that he lost? Because I just want to play you this. This is from the January 6th hearing. And this is a bunch of staffers saying, yep, yep, he knew he lost. So we're in the Oval and there's a discussion going on. And the president says, I think it's, it could have been Pompeo, but he says words to the effect of, yeah, we lost, we need, we need to let that issue go to the next guy, meaning President Biden. I remember maybe a week after the election was called, I popped into the Oval just to like give the president the headlines and see how he was doing. And he was looking at the TV and he said, can you believe I lost to this effing guy? Mark raised it with me on the 18th, and so following that conversation where the motorcade ride driving back to the White House, and I said, like, does the president really think that he lost? And he said, you know, a lot of times he'll tell me that he lost, but he wants to keep fighting it, and he thinks that there might be enough to overturn the election, but, you know, he, he pretty much has acknowledged that, he, that he's lost. If you were bringing a case like this to trial, Paul, would you need him to know he lost? It, it certainly will help persuade the jury for crimes like obstruction of an official proceeding or conspiracy to defraud the United States, that he had that criminal mind state. But, Joy, that's been established over and over. We just heard from Elisa Farrah Griffin, who was the White House communication director. She said Trump told her days after the election, can you believe I lost? Mark Miley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs Chief of Staff, says Trump told him he lost that December. Trump's people filed 60 lawsuits claiming fraud in the election, and they lost 60 times. There's audio of Steve Bannon saying before the election that Trump was going to say he won, even if he really didn't. I repeat, Bannon said that before the election. So, Joy, the evidence suggests that Trump knew he lost, but he just didn't care. As far as he was concerned, losing the election didn't mean that he still couldn't be president. And, and that extraordinary subversion of democracy by a sitting president is exactly why Jack Smith has to prosecute this case. 
Uh, Joshua, let me ask you this question. Do you, you, you talked you, in your report, you guys talked about you assuming it's going to be a narrow prosecution. There are a lot of people who were a part of this scheme and there are a lot of witnesses and we can put up a whole list of them from Mike Pence to Mark Short to Jared Kushner. You can go on and on and on. If it's a narrow prosecution the way it was in the documents case where it was just Waltine, Nana and Trump, who would you say should be the most nervous about being that second guy if there's a second guy prosecuted? Well, at a minimum, as a second guy, it's the one who shows up the most through the January 6th uh, committee report, which is John Eastman, who drafted the memorandum, who orchestrated much of the, the actual uh, uh, electoral use of the ele false electoral certificates and also the pressure campaign against Pence. Now, there's probably going to be several other people, but he's probably the one that needs to be most nervous. President Biden is closing out a week-long trip to Europe, where NATO cleared the path for its future member, Sweden, and vowed to embrace Ukraine when conditions are right. He spent the day in Helsinki with the leaders of Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and Iceland, celebrating the newest member, Finland. A strong display of unity for the alliance as Ukraine continues its counteroffensive against Russia's invasion. Biden's trip demonstrates the strength and endurance of the international coalition against a weakened Russia, just weeks after an attempted mutiny by the Wagner Group. At this critical moment in history, this inflection point, the world is watching to see, will we do the hard work that matters to forge a better future? Will we stand together? Will we stand with one another? Will we stay committed to our course? This week, Finland and the United States and our allies and partners said a resounding, loud yes. Yes, we'll step up. Yes, we'll stand together. And yes, we'll keep working toward a stronger, safer, and more secure world. Biden's visit was a dramatic about face for the United States. His predecessor was openly hostile to the NATO alliance and its members. In what looks like low-key shade, the Biden administration held today's events in Helsinki almost five years to the day after Trump stood side by side with Putin in that same city and told reporters he trusted the former KGB agent more than America's intelligence agencies. They said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have... Uh... President Putin, uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this, I don't see any reason why it would be. So I have great confidence in my intelligence people, but uh, I will tell you that President Putin was extremely strong and powerful in his denial today. The former president, who likes to say the world is laughing at Biden, was technically the only president of the United States to be laughed at by the almost 200 members of the United Nations at the General Assembly. In less than two years, my administration has accomplished more than almost any administration in the history of our country. America's so true. Didn't expect that reaction, but that's okay. Well, it's fair to say Biden is having a strong week. He's expanded NATO, embarrassed Putin, and overseen a significant drop in inflation, which could explain why MAGA Republicans are losing their marbles over in the House. Last night, House Republicans loaded up the National Defense Authorization Act, which funds the Pentagon, with a string of poison pill amendments that would end the Pentagon policy of reimbursing expenses for travel to obtain an abortion, prohibit the Department of Defense from providing gender-affirming care, and gut diversity and inclusion programs. Oh, and that's not all. Marjorie Taylor Greene, following the lead of her colleagues who want to defund the federal police, a.k.a. the FBI, well, she tried to insert an amendment that would strike $300 million in funding for Ukraine. But that was a bridge too far for the, best, for the rest of her caucus and didn't make it into the final version. However, the remaining demands endanger the passage of what is typically a bipartisan bill and faces a daunting path forward in the United States Senate. Joining me now is retired Admiral James Stavridis, former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO and MSNBC Chief International Analyst, and David Jolly, MSNBC political analyst and former Republican congressman who is no longer affiliated with the party. 
Thank you both for being here. And Admiral Savridis, I do have to ask you just for a general comment on the difference in tone and stature for the United States and dignity for the United States and having a president like Joe Biden, who is an international, you know, sort of a, a proud member of the international community uh, and doesn't, you know, suck up to Putin <laughs> in Helsinki and what we used to have. Yeah, every time I see that footage from Helsinki, I, I find it incredibly unbelievable that an American president would stand there and do that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've known President Biden a long time when he was vice president. He visited many times to NATO. I've watched him sit at the dinner table at the ambassador's house and literally walk around and discuss every member of the alliance in detail. Boy, does he understand the world and what a difference it makes. Um, we ought to really celebrate this moment, Joy, for the alliance, and yeah. in particular, the accession of Sweden and Finland. These are two incredibly capable turnkey militaries. Sweden at one point provided my personal protection in Afghanistan, their special forces, their fighters, aircraft are incredible. The Finns have more combat capability on the ground than almost any nation in Europe. You know, that distant boom you hear is Vladimir Putin's head exploding at frustration with the upcheck of the alliance led by President Biden. Yeah, and I think the other boom that you might hear, the sort of echoing boom, David Jolly, might be the Republicans' heads exploding because they actually, I think it's almost as embarrassing that the United States Congress took a vote on whether to defund our ally that is being invaded by Russia. That, they're, that they literally, that the fact that, you know, Kevin McCarthy had to let them take that vote, I think is also quite humiliating. Your thoughts? Yeah, but that's expecting a party that has no shame to be capable of feeling embarrassment. Yeah. And I think that's how Donald Trump has kind of reshaped the Republican Party. The admiral's exactly right. Joe Biden restored leadership on the world stage, restored, uh, restored diplomatic leadership. And if there is a domestic political contrast to be drawn, it is how Donald Trump led himself and reshaped the party, someone who is transactional by nature. So if if Vladimir Putin's the highest bidder, he's going to work with Putin over our alliance for freedom in NATO, and also somebody with the vanity and narcissism that we watch. So if a, nearly a century of history has suggested that NATO is our strongest way of protecting freedom in the West, that wasn't Donald Trump's idea. So he doesn't like it. And what happened is that immaturity of leadership has infected the entire Republican Party. And you see it in these amendments on the floor of the House right now trying to defund our support of Ukraine. Yeah. And Admiral, I have to I'm going to play for you, Joe Biden, uh, President Biden's response, because you as somebody who is a leader of NATO and, and obviously as an admiral, a leader um, within the United States Navy, it just I wonder what how it strikes you that our the leadership of the United States Marines is being held hostage by one senator. Um, and he is no veteran. He has no military experience whatsoever, has not served the country in that way. Um, yet he still feels that because he's opposed to abortion, he can do this. Here's what President Biden had to say about Tommy Tuberville. He's jeopardizing U.S. security by what he's doing. I expect the Republican Party to stand up, stand up and do something about it. The idea that we're injecting into uh, fundamental foreign policy decisions what, in fact, as a domestic social debate on social issues, is bizarre. I don't ever recall that happening, ever. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's just totally irresponsible, in my view. Admiral, I'll just let you res uh, add your thoughts. Um, the president, obviously, is exactly right. And, you know, Coach Tuberville, you know, is a football coach. He ought to understand that teams need leaders and you can't just rip out the coaches. And that's what's happening. We're going to have a U.S. Marine Corps, arguably our most elite fighting force without a commandant for the first time in 150 years. You think Coach Tuberville would send his football team out onto the gridiron? And here's a news flash. Our national security is not a game. We got to get past this, through it, over it, whatever it takes. But I, I yield to the distinguished congressman from Florida to tell me how to get the Republicans to take this on, please. Well, I hate to say it, but he kind of did. I mean, he kind of did ditch his college football team 
to go to Alabama and left them in the lurch. So maybe he feels like that is a history he just would like to repeat with the entire Marine Corps. Uh, <laughs> let me throw it over to you. I mean, he did. Um,